Humble Mug. Growing up, I was always a console generation or two behind the current gen. But being a kid who was born a few years before the emergence of the internet, this wasn't necessarily something I paid attention to. My very first memory of gaming was playing the Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt combo that came with the NES, and my first system that I ever owned was a Super Nintendo, which was given to me by my uncle who was himself moving on to current gen consoles and PC gaming. By the time I was playing the Super Nintendo for the first time, the Nintendo 64 and PlayStation 1 were in their twilight years, and the Xbox, PS2, GameCube era was already upon us. My parents surprised me with an Xbox on Christmas, and though of course I have some fond memories with titles like Halo or Prince of Persia, I felt like I was missing out on something. With the money I had saved up through various birthdays, chores, and Christmases, and of course with the permission to use my mom's eBay account, I eventually got a Nintendo 64 with a bundle of games. While a majority of the rest of the world were debating which console version of Soul Calibur 2 they should be picking up, I found myself willingly opting to be a generation behind again. And man, I loved my Nintendo 64. Super Mario, Donkey Kong, Mega Man, and Star Fox all got the 64-bit treatment, and I also remember really enjoying games like Gauntlet Legends and Rocket the Robot on Wheels. My Nintendo 64 also came with some fun fighters like Killer Instinct and Biofreaks. Hell, even Quest 64 was fun, until it wasn't. But one game that really proved to be somewhat of a sleeper hit for me was San Francisco Rush 2049, which I affectionately refer to as 2049. Rush 2049 was the third game in the Rush arcade racing game series and easily my favorite one. It features an aesthetic set in the near future, sporting somewhat realistic depictions of what cities might look like in the coming years. There are lots of different cars, racetracks, and a variety of modes to play through as well, such as the absolutely insanely fun Twisted Metal-esque battle mode, which even to this day is a blast to play with four players, and a stunt mode in which you could use the wings of the car because yes, we will apparently have winged vehicles in 2049. You can use those to pull off cool stunts by flying off ramps and speed boosts to collect points. It's like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, but with with vehicles. And wings, you can't forget the wings. Though I was objectively much better in the racing and battle modes than I was in the stunt mode, and even though I'd agree that those modes are also much more fun, it was actually the stunt mode in Rush 2049 that sticks with me the most and in many ways was the inspiration behind this video. You see, the stunt mode was very simple. Drive forward, hit the speed boost, hit the ramp, and use your wings to try to land the jump after you do some sort of trick. If you blow up or land badly, just try again. There are these optional coins that you can collect in the stage, but you don't have to, and most of the time when I did collect them, it was by accident anyway. There weren't other drivers to worry about, no one was trying to race me or blow me up, it was just me, the ramps, and this industrial trance music. I haven't been able to identify why exactly this specific combination of elements came together in such a specific way for me, but without fail, I would enter this sort of flow state very quickly when playing stunt mode. The gameplay was simple but engaging enough to where I could continue playing while simultaneously letting my mind drift off into other areas. It was while playing stunt mode that I navigated through the various problems that many middle schoolers have. Trying to figure out if my friends actually think I'm cool, trying to decide the best way I could go about asking the person I have a crush on if they'd like to hang out sometime, even though I can barely make eye contact with them, you know, that kind of thing. And it was in this specific routine, this specific ritual of playing through the same stunt level over and over and over and rarely ever hitting a score that was actually impressive, that I'd solve a lot of these mental conundrums. I became more confident in my interactions with my friends during that awkward time everyone faces when their hormones and insecurities are developing, and I did eventually muster the courage to ask out my crush. Yeah, it went nowhere and we were both awkward as hell, just like any other middle school relationship often is, but I put myself out there and that's what matters. And in a weird way, I actually owe some credit to Rush 2049 for helping me make some decisions in my life that were important to me at the time. Journaling was way too boring to hold my attention as a kid, I was too embarrassed to talk to my parents or really anyone about girls at that age, and video games were the only activity I did back then that allowed me to detach while also doing something fun. Fast forward now to 15 plus years later Later, and I find myself facing slightly more advanced, shall we say, mental conundrums. As an adult, I have less time for games than I used to, and when I do have free time, I sometimes feel guilty for playing games when there are other more quote-unquote productive things that I could be doing. I did find a loophole in this by making a YouTube channel so that I could play more games though. Toffee! But anyway, a lot of my video game related activity over the years has often been relegated to consuming content pertaining to video games. Besides YouTube, one of my favorite places to go for this type of thing is the Patient Gamers subreddit. As someone who still enjoys retro games, even those that I didn't grow up with or have nostalgia for, this place seemed like the place for me. 
And for the most part it is, but a growing trend I see when I browse through the subreddit is just the sheer volume of people who are so concerned about their backlog. They feel some buyer's remorse after spending a bit on the latest Steam sale or for buying anything else in general when they still have these games that they quote unquote need to finish. They also begin to feel guilt because instead of becoming immersed in this new batch of games that they just got, they give maybe a couple hours of their attention to one of them, only to find themselves back in the quick, dirty, and familiar embrace of lovers past like Skyrim or Stardew Valley. They berate themselves for not completing a game, for not getting their money's worth out of the game, many equating the goodness of a game as the gameplay hours you can milk out of it for the amount of money you spend on the total package. And so when this valuation seems to be off, or in the negative even, players begin to look at their library and feel overwhelmed, and it results in them going back to something familiar, or they end up just not choosing anything at all. And it's an understandably worrisome and bad feeling that I'm sure many of us have had. But is this something that you need to feel bad about? Is every game meant to be enjoyed in its entirety to completion? Are you meant to know the ins and outs of every game in existence that might appeal to you? Is it required that you find every single Korok seed in Breath of the Wild or complete every single Riddler trial in the Arkham games to enjoy them? Are you any less of a gamer if you didn't platinum the game before you moved on to the next one? Just because a game offers potentially hundreds of hours of gameplay, does that mean you shortchange yourself if you only spent 10 enjoyable hours in it before moving on? When Steam alone adds 34 new games to its platform every single day, how can you possibly expect to know about, play, and complete every game you may potentially enjoy? Not to mention sometimes that there are games that may seem like they're perfect for you on paper, but once you start to actually get into them, something's just not right. And though I know it's much easier to say this than it is to actually believe it and live it, I'm here to say now that I've personally enjoyed my games so much more when I let go of this notion that I need to complete games. Like many other mediums of entertainment, the value of a game is highly subjective, dependent solely upon the player's individual experience with that game. A peculiar trend I've noticed with video game communities in comparison to communities formed around other forms of entertainment, such as art, movies, books, or other mediums, is that many who are highly invested in games to the point where they see video games as a form of art often guilt themselves over what they consume or don't consume. No one blames anyone for rewatching the Lord of the Rings trilogy, even the extended versions on a yearly or biannual basis because they're good movies, and that's the only justification that someone needs to do it. Sure, they could be watching a new highly rated film that they'd never seen before in that same block of time, but if they chose LOTR because they are familiar with what they're getting and they know the experience will be great, there's no problem there in most people's eyes. Rereadings of books are often highly encouraged because it can give you greater insight to plot details that you may have missed out on on the first time around, and this can often enhance discussion around said book with your peers who may be equally invested. If one of your favorite artists in the world is Death Cab for Cutie, it would be totally understandable that songs from their 2000 and three transatlanticism albums still show up in your Spotify wrapped all these years later. Even though Death Cab has plenty of other good songs, even though there are a myriad of similar artists, and even though new artists appear on the platform every single day, no one is going to blame you for turning on title and registration or the sound of settling for the thousandth time because those songs might take you back to that one specific moment in your life that brings you comfort, or because maybe you just need a good cry, or maybe it's just that the songs are good and you like to listen to them. Despite how much of a non-issue this is when you really think about it, the truth is that it's just all too easy to beat yourself up and feel guilty when you realize you just logged your 100th hour into your third playthrough of Stardew Valley even though you just bought Spiritfarer a week ago and you still haven't touched it yet. Despite how much you know you're going to like the game, despite the thousands of positive reviews that it's received since release, you're just not ready to dive into something outside of your comfort zone just yet. The simple answer one might give for why we do this to ourselves is that we often feel like we're wasting money if we don't immediately jump into this new game. You're paying the same for a Spotify membership or an HBO Max account regardless of what song you vibe to or which movie you see. But unless you're on something like Xbox Game Pass, when you're buying just one game at a time, you might feel like you just wasted money if you're not playing that game immediately after purchasing it. And while this is a valid point, I'd argue that the rationale for feeling guilt over these types of decisions goes much deeper than that. Gaming community, streamers, social media, hustle culture, productivity gurus, and life in general has had such an effect on the way that we perceive things. The speed in which the world seems to move at in this internet age feels astronomically faster than it did when we were kids. Whether knowingly, unknowingly, maliciously, or without malintent, these outside factors greatly impart this feeling of FOMO or the fear of missing out onto you. 
I'm very much aware of this, and so are big gaming companies, and so the idea of a patient gamers community, where people kind of go against the grain by getting together to discuss games that they've enjoyed years after release, either because they never got to get around to the game upon its initial release, or as an effort to save money, or a little bit of both, that greatly appealed to me. Because if there is any community revolving around gaming that should be immune to the effects of FOMO, it should be the patient gamers community, right? Unfortunately, I've found that virtually no one is immune to FOMO, but at best they can become aware of the psychological effects that it might have on them. The reason the fear of missing out has such a stranglehold on people's perception and outlook on how they spend their time is because we are bombarded 24-7 with content nowadays that is telling you what you should be doing with your time. Even my video that you're watching right now could be an example of that. Additionally, the barrier of entry for so many forms of entertainment is just drastically lower. Indie music artists, novelists, writers, movies, video games, and so on pop off every single year and defy expectations routinely, and this allows them to appear in the same conversation that normally only AAA brands that have committees of writers and millions of dollars in marketing backing them up were appearing in before. It's truly a great thing in so many ways, but when you are only one person, it can be overwhelming to know that there are likely thousands of things in the world going on right now that you would likely love, but may miss out on or never experience just due to your lack of awareness of that thing even existing. There are people much younger than you becoming successful every single day, and it makes you feel like you need to be working on some sort of passion project or side hustle, and so when you're always trying to micromanage your time, it's hard to fit video games into that. And when you do finally have time for a video game, you want to make sure that it's quality time. And I get that. No one is immune to the passage of time, even the most patient of gamers, and what matters most is if you use the spare time you have to enjoy yourself. If you have become Linus's friend for the 13th time in Stardew Valley, if you have seen the Fellowship take up arms and pledge to face Sauron for the sixth time, if you've chosen to write a script for a video pondering the question, is there a correct way to play video games? All of these choices, regardless of how many times you've done it before or how much time you've burned experiencing these things, all of these choices are equally valid, and their value completely comes from how much you enjoy participating in that activity at that moment. As long as you're not hurting anyone by doing it, it's fine. And so, is there a right way to enjoy games? Yeah, there is. The right way to enjoy games is however you are enjoying them in this present moment. If that means that you just finished playing Disco Elysium through its entirety, and you immediately start up a new playthrough so that you can experience the game as a different version of Harry Dubois and possibly arrive upon a new ending, or if that means you played five short but enjoyable hours of Pac-Man World Repack over a week or two whenever you had the spare moment and then you kind of forgot about the game and occasionally kick yourself for not playing more because it's such a cute little charming game that you are really looking forward to, both of those methods of enjoying games are valid because the point of playing games is to enjoy them. I will be the first to admit that Doom 1993 is one of my all-time favorite games ever, but most of my playtime in that game has solely been in the first episode, Knee Deep in the Dead. I could replay the levels in that episode endlessly and enjoy it, and even though I have less experience with the other three episodes as someone else may have, the fact that Doom stands shining above several other franchises in my memory won't change. Couple that with the endless amount of mods that have come about for this game, and I have certainly got my money's worth. I've played through Earthbound more times than I can count. I've seen the ending many times since I was a child. It's my favorite game of all time. But that doesn't necessarily mean that my enjoyment of the game is more valid than someone else who says Earthbound is also their favorite even though they've spent less time with the game than I have. So I implore you to please play without guilt. Play without judgment towards yourself or others. Play with kindness and open-mindedness. Pick up the game, preferably on sale if you can, that looks enjoyable to you, and get to it when you have the chance. Try to give everything a fair shake, but realize that some games are just simply not going to hold your attention more than others for whatever reason, and maybe one day you'll come back around to it and it'll be a different experience. I promise you that when you let go of this notion that you have to complete everything and that you're missing out by playing this game over that game, your experiences will be much better. You will be more present with the game you're currently playing, and you'll have a much wider pool of experiences to draw from when you think about the games that you've played. You may even become surprised on which games reel you in once you allow yourself to be removed from that guilt. I still haven't completed Elden Ring, but I did impulse purchase Deathspeak, this quirky and raunchy action RPG from 2010, after seeing Austin Eruption recommend the game in a video I watched while taking a lunch break away from the lands between. I had never heard of it before, and I'd say Elden Ring is definitely the better game, but Deathspeak totally stole my attention from Elden Ring for a weekend and I beat it in two sittings. Did I make a wrong or a bad decision by prioritizing that game for a time? I don't think so, because I enjoyed the time I spent with Deathspeak, and even if I 
I were to never go back to Elden Ring, which is unlikely, I still spent over 40 quality hours in that magical world. And so I'm sure you're wondering, how does this all relate back to San Francisco Rush 2049? Even though I never got an enviable high score in the game's stunt mode, and even though I was never really even that great at the game's main racing modes to be honest, 2049 carries a lot of memories for me throughout my life because of its uncanny ability to allow me to reflect and sit outside of myself for a moment. A handful of the songs from that soundtrack are forever etched into my memory, wrapped in a nice blanket of fondness and nostalgia. I can still picture the first racetrack with that iconic Slim Jim gas station to the right after that first curve, and I know exactly what the first ramp in stunt mode looks like in my mind's eye. Though I have no way of knowing really how much time I spent in that game, and though I know somewhat objectively that there are better games out there, even better racing games out there, San Francisco Rush 2049 is one of my favorite games of all time in my heart, and that will likely never change. 2049 taught me that your relationship with games is defined best by what that game means to you and how much you enjoyed that game. Not necessarily the hours you put into it, the completion percentage, or how many achievements you got. I owe a lot to that game, and I hope that you're lucky enough to have some games in your collection that give you similar feelings too. If you're still here, thanks so much for watching, and as always, stay humble.